Hello everybody, uh, today um, in this video I'd like to talk to you about uh, forecasting in general. So uh, I'd like to start with a few quotes about forecasting. Okay. So prediction is very difficult, especially if it's about the future. Okay. Uh, so these are quotes from some notable people. Okay. Uh, here's a quote from uh, the chairman of IBM, who said, uh, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Um, and then uh, this is Digital Equipment Corporation. There's no reason uh, why anyone would want to have a computer in their home. Uh, who the hell wants the actors uh, to hear the actors talk? Okay. The bomb will never go off. I speak as an expert in explosives. Okay. So forecasting uh, can be a bit tricky, to say the least. Okay. So, uh, now, it's from a managerial perspective, okay, uh, so you are all managers or will be managers or on your way to be managers and leaders in your organization. Uh, why is forecasting important? Okay. In other words, without a forecast, what could you not do as a manager? Okay. And the simple answer is, you couldn't plan. You couldn't plan, right? So every manager needs to make plans about the future. But before you make a plan, any plan, you need to have an idea about the future. So before you make a plan, you need a forecast. And it doesn't matter whether you're a manager in human resources, in marketing, in finance, in logistics, in any business function, you need to make a plan. And before you make a plan, you need a, a forecast. Okay. So in this class, we're going to talk a lot about uh, sales forecasting, but do companies forecast other things as well? Uh, do they forecast anything beyond sales? Well, depending on uh, their business, some uh, companies may be interested in forecasting, let's say, fuel prices. Okay? For transportation companies, fuel prices are very important, so maybe they want to forecast future fuel prices. So for some companies, maybe let's say they're in agriculture and a weather forecast may be important for them. Uh, maybe if uh, you are in import-export business, uh, exchange rates, you may want to forecast exchange rates. Okay? So there are many other things in business that you may want to forecast in addition to sales. So a company needs to make a plan and they need a forecast. Okay. Now which department or departments use forecasting? The simple answer is every department. Every department needs to make a forecast and therefore every department needs a forecast. Okay. And in business, uh, in typical in a typical company, there are uh, every department has a forecast, but usually nobody's forecast agrees with anyone else's forecast in a company. Okay, so you will have all these forecasts, but they they'll all come conflict with each other, and everybody will think, okay, my my forecast is the best. All other forecasts are bad. Okay, so every department will need a forecast. So, uh, in this class, uh, we're talking about supply chain management, but whatever your major is, or whatever department you're working in, uh, you will uh, either uh, generate a forecast, 
or you will use a forecast. Okay, so uh, I think this class will be helpful to you no matter what you do because even if you don't generate a forecast yourself, you want to know how to use forecasts for decision making and even more importantly, you want to be able to tell good forecasts from bad forecasts. Okay, so people will bring forecasts to you and before you take their forecast, you want to make sure how good their forecast is. So I think this class will help you evaluate forecast quality before you can base your decisions on, on a forecast. Okay, okay. Um, so how often is forecasting done? Uh, is it just maybe once a year, like annual forecasts? Well, there are annual forecasts, there are quarterly forecasts, there are um, weekly or even daily forecasts. So companies forecast all the time, okay? So uh, um, companies basically forecast all the time. So this thing. Okay, so when you make a forecast, you look into the future, okay? But how far you look into the future makes a difference. So are you looking, let's say, uh, maybe a week, two weeks, a month into the future? So that's that would be a short-term forecast, okay? Uh, now long-term will be... Uh, more than one year, like two, three, four, five years into the future, and medium term, maybe maybe a, a quarter, two, three, four, five quarters. Okay, so uh, you have different uh, types of forecasts for different time horizons. Now, which forecast is more accurate? Okay, is a short term forecast more accurate than a long term, or a long is a long term? more accurate than a short term. In general, uh, short term forecasts are more accurate than long term forecasts. Why? Because uh, there is more uncertainty. Okay? The farther you look into the future, the more uncertainty you face. Okay? The, the farther you look into the future, the more things can happen and things can change. But if you're looking uh, at the next day or next week, the things don't change as much from one day to the next, from one week to the next, from one, one month to the next. So there's less uncertainty here, so more accurate forecasts, and there's more uh, uncertainty here, less accurate forecasts, okay? So uh, which forecasts are made uh, frequently? So basically, um, if you make, let's say, an annual forecast, uh, uh, maybe you, would, you do it once a year, update your annual forecast every year. But if you have like a weekly forecast, you just generate a weekly forecast every week. Every week. So more frequent here, less frequent here. Okay. Now, when you, let's suppose you have a company uh, let's say uh, Ford, the Ford Motor Company, and uh, so at the firm level they have total sales. This is their aggregate sales, and you can break down their sales. Let's say across different countries. Let's say United States uh, versus China versus Europe versus I don't know, India somewhere. Okay. So this is everything they sell in the U.S., everything they sell in China, everything they sell in Europe, etc. And then you can break down uh, country-level forecasts across different brands. Okay, brand A, brand B, etc. And then each brand can be further broken down into cars and trucks, different lines of product. And at the very bottom, at the most detailed level, you have the SKU level forecasts. 
Okay. So probably you already know this, but uh, what does SKU stand for? SKU stands for Stock Keeping Unit. Okay, Stock Keeping Unit. So what is an SKU? So for example, this black marker is an SKU. Okay, so there's a, there's a specific product number, Stock Keeping Unit number for this black uh, marker. And if I had a red marker, that would be a different SKU. A green marker, still different SKU. Okay, so start keep keeping unit identify each product offering. Okay, SKU. So, so now the question is, should you forecast the total sales? Okay, and then break the forecast at the total level into country level forecast and then further break down the country level forecast all the way up to SKU level. So that's the top down approach. So you start with the most aggregate level, forecast at the most aggregate level and then break it down. Um, the other approach is the bottom up approach. So you can generate a forecast for each SKU. So each SKU will have its own forecast. So how many black markers will I sell? How many green markers? How many red markers? Okay. And then you uh, uh, add them up. You aggregate them uh, across product lines, brands, etc. And then you get uh, to the uh, total forecast. Okay. So that's a bottom-up approach, and the question is, uh, which approach gives you a better forecast? Okay, which approach gives you a more accurate forecast? So, so if you think about it, uh, so we've talked about uncertainty uh, when you're looking into the future. Uh, if you think about uh, fluctuations, if you uh, think about variability in sales, okay, uh, each SKU will have a different level of fluctuation, different type of fluctuation, different timings. Typically, what happens is that at the SKU level, you have the most variability. But when you aggregate the forecasts, when you aggregate the sales, let's say uh, you have several different colors here, and then you add up all those colors into a single marker line, product line. And then you add up all the office equipment into a single, uh, uh, let's say, brand or something like that. So those, all those individual ups and downs cancel each other out. Okay. Typically, uh, the total sales are much smoother and individual level SKU forecasts are typically much more fluctuating. There's much more variability here. So as a result, it's easier to forecast at the aggregate level because there's less variability. And it's much more difficult to get a to get an accurate forecast at the individual SKU level. So again, uh, uh, one of my uh, experiences with Wendy's. So the marketing department in Wendy's uh, was very happy with the forecasts. However, the operations department was not happy, and they thought they were forecasts were really really off. And how come they can look at the same data and at the same operations and one department can be happy and the, depart the other department will be unhappy? The reason was the marketing department was looking at total sales, which, were, which was like 90% accurate. However, the operations department was looking at the individual store level forecasts, which were like 40-50% accurate. 
And that's only natural because each store has a lot of variability. But when you aggregate, when you add up all the store level forecasts, the total sales forecast will be much smoother and easier to forecast. Now, which department is right? And the answer to that is yes. That means, so uh, marketing is right at looking at total sales because that's what they care about, okay? And operations is right about looking at individual level, individual stores, because that's what they do, that's what, what that's the level that, work, that they work at, okay? So each department is looking at a different aspect of forecasting because they need different levels of forecasts for their decisions. So marketing does not make store level decisions, okay? So they don't look at store level forecasts, they look at total sales, but operations looks at individual stores because that's how they manage individual stores and they look at individual store level forecasts. Um, so which one is more accurate, which one is more frequent? Uh, they can be both equally frequent or equally uh, infrequent. Uh, depends on the operation and depends on how you manage your data. Okay. So, uh, Another way of looking at forecasts is uh, point forecast versus range forecast. Okay, so point forecast means uh, there's a single number. Range forecast gives you a range between two numbers. So for example, if I said uh, tomorrow's weather temperature is going to be 80 degrees. Okay, 80 degrees, single number, point forecast. But if I said, oh, tomorrow's temperature is going to be uh, from 85, uh, I'm sorry, 80 to 85 degrees, 80 to 85, so that's a range forecast, okay? And then the question is, which type of forecast is more accurate? Would you be more accurate if you just picked a uh, single number? or if you picked a range between two numbers. Of course, uh, range forecasts are more accurate, okay? uh, because they, they cover more eventualities. Um, however, the question then becomes, if range forecasts are more accurate, why do we still use point forecasts, right? And uh, the question is, so the answer is, uh, point forecasts are actionable. Actionable means, as a manager, you can act, you can make a decision based on a single number, okay? So let's say you're planning a party and you're uh, forecasting, uh, let's say, uh, so you want to order pizza for your party, but uh, before ordering pizza, you need to think about how many people will show up, okay? Now, a range forecast would be, let's say, a more accurate forecast, but when you actually order pizza, you need a single number. Okay. You need to call up the pizza place and then you, you need to give them a single number. So for that, you need a, a point forecast. Okay. So point forecasts are more actionable. Okay. So uh, qualities of a good uh, forecast. Okay. So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the forecasting process. Okay. So uh, there are certain steps in forecasting, okay? Uh, so you just don't 
but generate a number off the top of your head. So the first step is, before you even look at the data, you need to understand the uh, decisions that the forecast will support. Okay, so our uh, our framework is this. Okay, so oops. so uh, forecasts support decisions. Okay, and this uh, leads to for performance. Okay. So the idea is uh, better forecasts lead to better decisions, and better decisions lead to better uh, firm performance. In other words, when you generate a forecast, uh, you should not try to be technically correct, not, I'm sorry, uh, mathematically sophisticated. You need to look at the first you need to think about the decision and then think about what type of forecast will best support that decision okay so the type of forecast you generate doesn't necessarily has to be doesn't necessarily have to be the most mathematically sophisticated but it should be the best forecast to support the particular decision okay so, in the first part of this class, we're going to learn about what type of forecast best support what kind of decisions, okay? So, in the second half, given a particular forecast, given that particular forecast, what's, what's the best decision to make, okay? So, uh, you need to think about, before you start with forecasting, you, not, you need to start about uh, thinking about the decision, okay? Who will use your forecast? And then who will use your forecast to make what kind of decisions? The, the problem here is, usually the uh, forecaster and the decision maker are different people. Okay, so one person will make the forecast, a different person will make the uh, decision. Now, uh, so the forecaster needs to understand the needs of the decision maker. Okay, so it's not just that, okay, I, I, uh, I know mathematics, I know statistics, I can do fancy, uh, mathematical models and then I can use the latest software that's just beside the point okay you need to first start with the decision maker in mind okay and then understand the decision makers needs what does the decision maker care about okay so uh, what what's the time horizon of the decision okay what level of detail is uh, required for that decision. Okay, uh, how accurate should the forecast be? How much error can the decision maker tolerate? Okay, and the idea is how do you uh, make the decision maker trust you? Okay, so the thing is, uh, if the decision maker makes a bad decision, because of your forecast, it's still on them. Okay, it's still going to hurt their career. Okay, because they're the decision maker; they're taking the risk. But can they trust your forecast to put their career on the line? Okay, so you need to really understand uh, the decision, the, the risks that the decision maker faces when making their, their decision. And you need to try to address the concerns of the decision maker to the best of your ability as the forecaster.
So once you understand uh, the decision to be made based on your forecast and the decision process and the decision maker, their risks, etc., the second step is to gather data. Now, when I was a college student, our problem was too little data. Today, uh, our problem is too much data, okay? And uh, the, the problem with too much data is people, too much data gives people a false sense of um, accuracy, okay? So let me show you a receipt. So I went uh, to this uh, Dunkin' Donuts and I bought a cup of coffee, uh, big cat, from Dunkin' Donuts, and they gave me this receipt, okay? And this receipt has some information, okay? So uh, it begins at the top with, welcome to Dunkin' Donuts, thank you. And then it says, store number 341489. Uh, okay, I didn't know that, but that's fine. So and then it says, eat in order number 203. No, that's not right. It was takeout, right? So I get my coffee and I leave. But they record it as eat in. Okay, and then it says, register, uh, register two, cashier such and such, Transaction sequence number such and such. A lot of information. Even before they get to my order. And then they get to my order, they say one hot coffee, medium, original blend, 185. No, no, it's not that. I got decaf. I didn't get the original blend. So so again, incorrect information, inaccurate information. Uh, subtotal, tax, total, discount, cha change, uh, MasterCard. As you can see, a single cup of coffee, something as small as a si uh, uh, single cup of coffee, generates this much information. And that's what I mean by too much data. Okay? And the problem with too much data is it's not necessarily accurate, okay? So you need to be very careful about data quality, okay? Today our problem is not too little data. Uh, our problem is too much data and inaccurate data. Okay, so in the third step, so we've looked at uh, the decision maker, what what the, the decision maker needs, uh, we've collected the necessary data, and then we're going to, uh, to choose uh, a forecasting technique. Okay, so uh, what technique should we use to process this data to generate a forecast, which the decision maker can then use? So. Uh, there are many, many forecasting techniques available. Uh, I don't know the number because every day people invent new forecasting techniques. It just uh, grows continuously. And uh, the, the good thing about this is that uh, com more complicated techniques are not necessarily better than simpler techniques. And, and we'll see this throughout the semester. So uh, just because you have a very, very fancy, very complicated statistical method, method does not necessarily mean you'll get a better forecast, okay? So you should use, uh, you, normally you should use simple methods. However, you should use uh, more complicated methods only if there is a very, very obvious reason to do so, okay? So uh, ease of use, reliability, accuracy, etc. And then the following thing is uh, you need to document your forecasting technique. 
Why? Because typically you will uh, periodically repeat uh, forecasts. You will generate the same forecast over and over and over again. And you want to make the forecasts comparable. You want to be able to compare last month's forecast to this month's forecast to next month's forecast. Okay? Uh, so you need to use the same method every month or every period so that you can compare them. If you use a different method every month, it will be very difficult to compare forecasts. And what's the point of comparing forecasts? The point is simply you want to make sure that your forecasts are uh, either of stable quality or improving in quality. Okay, so as you make monthly or weekly or annual forecasts, you want to make sure that the forecast quality is comparable, you have a stable forecast quality, or maybe even improving forecast quality. And to uh, uh, assess forecast quality, you want to be able to compare your forecasts. And you want to compare apples to apples, so you need to document apply, and apply the same forecasting method uh, over time. And if you see your forecast quality is deteriorating, which can be, okay, which happens, then you need to change your forecasting technique or maybe your data collection. But unless there's a reason like that, you want to apply the same method, the same data collection, the same forecasting technique over time. Okay? So, uh, that means uh, standardize the procedure, uh, let everybody know uh, that you could be working in a team and define everybody's responsibilities. You should know who does what. How do you communicate your forecast to higher levels? Okay. How do you present your forecast to people? So these should be fairly standard. Okay, so uh, just as I said, uh, you need to monitor your forecast performance over time. Uh, you want to have stable forecast quality. Uh, we're going to talk much more about this uh, in the com coming classes. Okay. So let's talk about forecasting methods. As I said, there are countless forecasting methods and the number is growing. And uh, one simple uh, categorization is uh, forecast methods are either qualitative or quantitative. Okay? So uh, all forecasting methods fall either under this uh, category or under this category. Okay? And the difference is here, qualitative means opinion-based, uh, quantitative means um, numerical, statistical, and okay, quantitative. So under qualitative methods, we have a number of uh, different methods. For example, we have uh, grassroots methods. So grassroots methods is, let's say, you have only a few customers. Let's say you're, you have a small business, and you have five customers, okay? And then it's easy to just pick up the phone, call all, all of your five customers, and then ask them, okay, how much are you going to buy from me next year? Call five customers, get five numbers, and then add them up, okay? Grassroots. Or maybe you have, uh, let's say, um, uh, a, sales pe a group of salespeople, Maybe you have six salespeople, seven salespeople. Just ask them, and then add their add up their forecasts. Okay, but what if you have a million customers? Of course, you can't do that, right? So uh, another method that you can use is executive judgment. Okay, so executive judgment is maybe somebody have a lot of expertise in a market. Maybe they have. Uh, 
a lot of expertise in a product line. Uh, maybe uh, they have a lot of power, okay? And then just off the top of their head, they say, okay, this is our forecast for next year or next quarter, okay? Another method, uh, opinion-based method, is uh, historical analogy, okay? Historical analogy. So uh, analogy means uh, you're comparing two things uh, that, and one of them have, has happened in the past. So let's say um, there is a Justin Bieber concert um, in TD Garden, for example. Okay, and you're trying to forecast how many tickets you will sell for the Justin Bieber concert. Uh, one thing you can do is you can look at the previous a concert that uh, you can look at the previous Justin Bieber concert at TD Garden. How, ma how many tickets did they sell last time? And based on that historical analogy, you can make a, a prediction for the next time for the next Justin Bieber concert. Okay? That's a historical analogy. So, and then there is the uh, Delphi method. Okay. Delphi method is about uh, uh, um, getting together a panel of experts, maybe four, five, six, seven experts, uh, subject matter experts, and they uh, exchange their opinions and then they try to come up with a consensus forecast. Okay, that's the Delphi method. And then there are uh, marketing research like focus groups, customer surveys, etc. So these are all. Uh, judgment-based, opinion-based, uh, qualitative forecasting methods. Okay. So, in terms of quantitative methods, numerical, mathematical, statistical methods, there's time series, there's causal, and there's simulation. Now, we're not going to go into simulation because it's uh, not very widely used. Uh, and it's uh, much more complicated, okay? So, for example, they use simulation models for COVID-19. Uh, so, we're not going to look at these in this class, but we're going to study time series and causal models. So, under quantitative methods, time series forecasts uh, time series analysis is uh, very, very widely used, okay? So, what is, what is the uh, basic idea behind time seri series analysis? So, it's a, uh, so the basic assumption in time series is that uh, there is a pattern in the data, maybe there is trend, there is seasonality, etc. And this pattern will continue into the future. So the time series uh, methods identify and, and measure uh, the patterns in the data, and they simply extend those patterns into the future. Okay. Now, this is called a black box approach because it does not tell you why there's a particular pattern. Maybe there's an upward trend, and time series shows you that trend, but it doesn't tell you why, why is it upwards. It doesn't tell you why it's not downwards, or why it's, why it's not level, okay? So it's a black box approach. It doesn't care why or how, it just says, okay, this pattern will continue into the future. Uh, now, the opposite approach is causal modeling, which is basically a regression analysis, okay? So here, the idea is uh, there are factors that uh, make demand go up or down. The changes in demand are caused by certain factors in the background. Now, which factors are, they, are these? 
the regression analysis tells you which factor affects your sales to what degree. Okay? It tells you which factors are significant and how much they affect your sales. Okay? So, and, uh, now, this is a little bit more complicated than, uh, uh, than type series analysis. It may require a little bit of expertise. But in this class, I'm going to teach you both time series methods and causal modeling. Simulation models, we're going to skip. So, now, let's compare qualitative methods and quantitative methods. Let's talk about their uh, uh, respective advantages and disadvantages. And um, typically, we, we cannot say if one is better than the other one. In certain cases, qualitative may, methods may be more accurate. In other cases, quantitative methods may be more accurate. Okay? And there are many companies that simply rely on opinion-based forecasting. They may have a lot of data, but they just say, okay, our, our judgment, our opinion is good enough. And it may be good enough. Okay? Uh, it may be that no mathematical method can surpass their qualitative judgments. It could be. Okay? It could be. Uh, sometimes qualitative, sometimes quantitative methods are better. So what, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Now, qualitative methods are opinion-based, so they are subjective. So they change from person to person. Okay, so uh, so these are per, uh, individual dependent uh, methods. Okay, so one person can be very good at uh, judgmental forecasting, but another person may not be so. However. Quantitative methods are objective because they rely on statistical methods. They don't change from person to person. They're, uh, they're uh, basically objective, right? So uh, qualitative data, okay, qualitative methods, I'm sorry, can make use of soft data, non-numerical, non-quantifiable uh, data. Okay, so for example, there are a lot of social movements, there's social media, there's public opinion, all these things are very important, but they cannot be easily quantified. You cannot easily uh, use them in a mathematical model. So in those cases, okay, qualitative methods are better to, in integrating, they're better in integrating uh, soft data. And uh, quantitative methods are better at handling large data sets. And as, as I said, today we have a, almost too much data, too much data. And uh, we humans cannot process, process as much data. So the huge data that we have today can be very easily handled by quantitative methods, the computing power, the uh, uh, memory uh, capabilities, uh, uh, everything has, has greatly expanded. Okay? So qualitative methods are also good for new products because new products typically don't have history, sales history. Okay? It's a new product. You have never sold that product or service before. So there is no historical analogy or anything. So in those cases where you don't have a lot of historical data, qualitative methods are better. Okay. Uh, so quantitative methods are more consistent. They're more efficient. Efficient means fast. Okay. And if you have a one-off event, uh, qualitative methods are better. But if you have a lot of history quantitative methods are better. And here you need to have numerical data to run quantitative methods. 
under quantitative methods, we're going to study two methods. Under quantitative methods, we're going to have time series and causal modeling. What are the relative advantages and disadvantages of time series versus qualitative, time series versus causal modeling? So, uh, causal modeling is better for long-term forecasts. Time series is better for short-term forecasts. So, let's say uh, if you're looking uh, at next week's forecast or next month, next quarter, shorter term. So, uh, time series is uh, better because the same patterns are likely to continue in the short term. However, if you're looking at next year, two, three, four, five years into the future, for long term, uh, causal modeling works better. Uh, the other thing is, uh, in your data, sometimes you have uh, shifts or turning points, or uh, this, the technical term is a uh, structural break. So let's say, uh, for example, uh, COVID-19 is a structural break. Okay? If you look at sales data, and like around this time, you will see a structural break in your your uh, data okay so if something like this happens if you're there's a shift in your data uh, then uh, causal modeling is better but if your data is relatively smooth if there are no structural breaks or shifts then time series is better okay? uh, when you use causal modeling, it gives you an understanding of mechanisms that influence sales. So, uh, as a manager, uh, causal modeling gives you a better understanding of what you can do to increase your sales. Because causal modeling tells you which factors affect your sales. Time series is a black box approach. Okay. So, now the disadvantage of causal modeling is that causal modeling requires more data, okay? Time series requires less data, and also you need a little bit of an expertise in interpreting the output from the causal model, okay, from the regression analysis. But uh, time series is much easier to interpret. So let's start with uh, time series analysis. Uh, time series analysis is uh, called, uh, also, it's also called extrapolation. What does extrapolation mean? So it basically means find the pattern and extend it into the future. So you could have like a uh, flat level, it could be a pattern, you know, some people would have uh, a flat uh, line, flat uh, level with random fluctuations, you could have trend, seasonality, cyclicality, okay? So uh, let me show you an example. So this uh, is an example of a level time series, okay? So what we see is uh, the average sales never changes. Okay? The average is constant. Okay? So this is our pattern. So this is our pattern. So let's say this is now. Okay? So in the past, we observed a flat pattern with some random fluctuation. And our forecast, so this is our forecast, because this is the future. So we're going to extrapolate. Extrapolation simply means this. Okay, I simply extend the line into the future. This is extrapolation. 
And this is our forecast. Okay. As, as simple as that. Okay. So, so this is one possible pattern. Another uh, possible pattern is you could have a, let's say, trend. So uh, you could have an upward trend, downward trend, etc. So, so this is uh, the trend, okay? And you see there's a uh, random fluctuation around the trend. And we'll, we'll just extrapolate, right? So our forecast will be this. So this is our forecast. Again, time series analysis. We don't know why, we don't know how, but it's just there's a, there's a trend, and we assume it's going to continue. Simple extrapolation. Okay, here's another pattern. Actually, uh, in a time series, you can have multiple forecasts at the same time. So here, uh, you can see uh, there's, a, there's a trend downward trend, let's say trend goes like this, okay. On top of the trend, we have seasonality, a pattern that repeats itself, okay, like this. So we have trend, we have seasonality, and we have random fluctuations, okay. And simply, we're just going to extend this into the future, okay? So this is basically what time series analysis is all about. Now, let me show you some real life data. So these are passenger numbers, uh, month, monthly passenger numbers, on these particular uh, flight routes. Okay, so Boston to PVC, I, I don't know what PVC stands for, but what you can see is there's a lot of a very highly seasonal pattern, okay? The average is the same, so you have a level time series, plus you have seasonality, plus you have some random fluctuations. Okay. So this is an example of a time series analysis. And so to forecast, you will simply just extend this uh, trend at the same level with the same seasonality into the future. Another uh, uh, route here, Boston to LaGuardia, okay. monthly total passenger numbers. Again, there's a trend, downward trend, and then you see seasonality. Okay. So uh, this is another example. San Francisco to Boston. Okay. Again, upward trend, and then uh, you can just uh, see the season, uh, seasonality. Okay. So here's an interesting example. So this is uh, Boston, Dallas, Fort Worth. Um, the, the, the first part of the uh, time series has a constant level and seasonality. But here we see a jump, OK? Now, is this a one-time thing? Is the time series going to go back to the average? Or is, is it going to stay there? We don't know. So if you see something like this, you need to be careful. Okay. So here, we see actually two patterns. From here to, to this, like to this time frame, roughly there's a downward trend. Okay. And here, you have a constant level. So you have two, uh, two patterns. Now when you forecast, 
you should not use the entire data set. Because this trend doesn't exist anymore. This trend has gone away. Now we have a new, new pattern. The new pattern is this. The new pattern is this. So when you extrapolate, you need to use this part of the data. Okay. So just because data is available doesn't mean you have to use the data. You need to look at the data, see which part is relevant, which, which part is irrelevant, and use the relevant part of the data. Again, uh, Boston to Miami, there's a slight upward trend. Uh, Boston to, I think this is Washington. Uh, so here's an interesting pattern. There is seasonality. There's a slight downward pattern. And the seasonality kind of like uh, shrinks, right? So the seasonal peaks and valleys become uh, closer to each other. They get closer to each other, OK? So again, here's an, another interesting pattern, uh, Boston to Phoenix. You have one pattern here. You have another pattern here. Okay, so this part is irrelevant. Now this part, again, depends on this. Okay, is this a one-time blip, or is it going to go back up here, or is it going to stay here? You need to be very, very careful. Uh, again, uh, downward trend and upward trend. This part is irrelevant, okay? This part is relevant. You need to use this part to, to uh, forecast. Uh, now, uh, we're going to cover all of these uh, quantitative methods. I'm going to teach how to uh, apply these methods uh, by hand in Excel and in SAS, okay? However, when you apply a method, you need to look at uh, the pattern in your data. If you have uh, a flat line, a constant level, these methods are appropriate. Okay. If you have a trend, these two methods are appropriate. Okay. If there is seasonality, these two methods are appropriate. Okay. So again, I'm going to teach you all of these methods. Uh, finally, there are two videos. Both of them are fairly short. Uh, this is about demand management. This is about more the uh, SaaS, the software. And uh, then you have in a few useful links. So this is a, a more general information type of website, forecasters.org. This is the professional association for demand management. So if you want to go into a demand management career or a forecasting career, this is a good uh, professional organization. And these two site websites are more on the technical end. So if you want to learn a little bit more, if you want to go a little bit more deeper into the uh, technical aspects of forecasting, these are some good uh, websites. Okay? So this concludes this lecture. Thanks for watching.